Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about prosecutorial misconduct and a new report from a coalition called It Can Happen to You. Our guests are Kat Dean, Communications Director for It Can Happen to You, who was the chief researcher on the report, and Peter B. Collins, a retired radio host and podcaster who worked on wrongful convictions for over 30 years as past president of the Freedom Foundation, a nonprofit founded by a San Quentin prisoner to support innocent inmates. There is a website you can check out at it can happen to, that's a numeral to, you.org. Uh, Peter and Kat, welcome to Talk World Radio. Great to be with you, David. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for producing this report and all the work you're doing. What are your, what are your primary findings? Well, David, uh, most people who are listening or watching uh, this interview are aware that over the last 20 years plus, there has been a wave of exonerations. Individuals who are convicted of serious crime, who are serving lengthy sentences, including life top sentences and the death penalty for crimes that they did not commit. And when you unpack what produces a wrongful conviction, near the top of the list is misconduct by prosecutors. They sometimes cover up um, inconsistencies in testimony or uh, the findings of investigations by police. They often will uh, hide the evidence. There is a Supreme Court ruling called Brady that requires a prosecutor to share evidence, including exculpatory evidence with the defense. And these are the most common faults that lead to a wrongful conviction. So the exonerations, over 280 in California alone, these exonerations often include misconduct by the prosecutors who sent somebody to prison. And under the system in California, the state bar is assigned the role of uh, investigating and disciplining prosecutors who break the law, who violate the rules of the court. But what Kat can tell us, and she's done excellent research on this, is that uh, by and large, there is no consequence. The state bar will either, you know, at worst, write a letter of rebuke to an individual but we don't see any cases of uh, law licenses being revoked or even suspended in, you know, except in a, in a handful of cases. Then if the state bar fails to act, uh, you can then file a brief with the state Supreme Court. And in a little bit, I'll take you through the details of the case of Jamal Trulove. But what it showed is that even when a law professor uh, filed an action with the state Supreme Court, the Supreme Court just waved it aside in a five to one vote. So our group is angling. We're in the middle of a two year project to get a bill passed in the legislature in Sacramento to uh, establish a commission on prosecutor conduct in California. And it's modeled on the one that is just currently getting started up in the state of New York. So that's what we're up to. And uh, we're really glad to have your interest in this issue today. Uh, I'm very, very interested. I hope a lot of people are. Kat, do you want to elaborate on, on what you've found in looking at all these cases in California? Well, this started with a, a report that was done by the Northern California Innocence Project that spanned prosecutorial misconduct cases between 1997 and 2009. And the, the, they started with 4,000 cases and then whittled it down to about 707 cases that they felt had merit. And of those, 67 prosecutors had committed misconduct more than, on more than one occasion. And yet in their time frame, they had only found that six of the prosecutors who were found to have committed this, this this misconduct were actually disciplined at all. And the discipline, as Peter pointed out, was minimal. There were a few suspensions, no one was disbarred. 
I went and did research to see if there had been additional prosecutors from that time in 13 years who were disciplined. And I found only about six more cases, six or seven more cases of discipline in the last uh, 13 years. So in total, in 26 years, we found about 13 cases of prosecutors um, being disciplined at all for misconduct. And yet you have thousands and thousands of claims of misconduct. Also, the state bar keeps no public record of filings of those of, of filings against prosecutors. So we have no idea how many complaints against prosecutors actually occur and how many of those complaints are even investigated. The commission has the ability to, it is transparent and independent and the authority to investigate all cases of prosecutorial misconduct. And that is their sole focus. And so there could be a lot more than what you know about? Oh, yes. Because not every case gets to the appellate court or the habeas court. Some people don't have the resources to file a habeas complaint. Yeah. That's where you would usually get, you know, new evidence that evidence that did not, not get heard at trial would then be put forward to a court to see if that would could offer relief. And many people can't afford that. If you if you're not on death row, you're you don't you have no entitlement to an appointed counsel for a habeas petition. Only for direct appeal. So the, the types of misconduct that we're talking about include uh, in the report include withholding evidence that, as Peter mentioned, that they are supposed to hand over, include yes. misleading jurors in opening and closing statements. Uh, presumably, that's not legal, uh, and include uh, inducing false testimony by witnesses who are sometimes themselves given leniency or actually cash payments. Um, I don't know what's legal, what's not there, but in many countries, you can't, uh, you know, use jailhouse snitches. You can't give somebody a break on their own criminal uh, charges if they testify against somebody else. I mean, this seems like something that ought to be banned. It It, it, it is allowed. In California, it's rampant. In the United in fact, States, right? But it shouldn't be, right? Oh, yeah, it shouldn't be. And actually, in California, as of 2016, to not give over for prosecutors to not give full disclosure of discovery is a felony. But no prosecutor has been tried um, in a criminal uh, court on this charge, even though many prosecutors have been found to have withheld discovery. So there's a shortage of the rule of law in the enforcers of the rule of law, it seems. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and David, what we have is uh, it, it's not all boys anymore, but it is the old boys network of lawyers protecting lawyers. And in some of these cases, the prosecutors who committed misconduct are now on the bench. They preside over cases where they can uh, put a thumb to the scales of justice and, uh, you know, tilt in favor of the prosecution. And David, one of the things that I like to point out is that some of this is driven by the pressure that comes from local media, particularly local television news coverage. So a crime is committed and a TV station will exploit that, uh, you know, we've seen a number of cases recently here in San Francisco where the initial assumptions that people made about a case were flat out wrong. But once they are reported on television, they leave a, a big impre impression on the viewer. And so the viewer believes that somebody is guilty because, hey, I saw it on the TV. And the prosecutors often feel pressured to deliver the verdict that has been uh, kind of preordained by the coverage. And we have many cases where the eyewitnesses identified the wrong person. And a prosecutor knew that, but went forward with the case anyway, because they didn't have another suspect, you know, in mind or in hand. And it's important to note that when a prosecutor and a court convict the wrong person. It's not only a deep injustice to that individual who can be held in custody for 25, uh, you know, up to 40 years. I mentioned that a handful of people were sentenced to death row 
based on misconduct. But the other side of that coin is that a guilty person is still out there. And Jeff Deskovic is one of the activists who helped pass the law to create a commission in New York. He knows from personal experience, he was convicted of killing a high school classmate and spent 16 years in prison. And it was when the real killer, to quote OJ, uh, was identified um, <clears throat> that Deskovic was freed. And this happens all too often where the innocent person meets the guilty person in prison. And sometimes that guilty person actually has the, uh, the moral <laughs> righteousness to say, you know what, I did that. And so, you know, it's important not only to have confidence in the system, not only to get the right outcome in terms of the innocent person, but also that the system work properly to identify and hold accountable the individual who actually committed the crime. And uh, when we talk about these numbers of exonerations and how many were on death row and so forth, I am I right that we have to remain aware that it's only a tiny fraction of cases where DNA could possibly come into play and overturn a conviction or, or some other new witness shows up. I, I mean, most cases, uh, we just don't know, right? I mean, this That's could exactly be a lot right. bigger. It's exactly right. I, I, I actually also work on wrongful convictions and there are cases I've been working on that without some, you know, force intervening, you're never going to know about them. The, uh, it's very... It's very common, I think, for some of these innocent people just to perish in prison. In fact, Jamal Trulove, who Peter will be talking about in more depth, he was stabbed in prison. He could have died. Um, I know of one defendant who I do believe is innocent who was brutally murdered. He'll never, he was, he was working very hard to prove his innocence. I mean, God bless him. He was filing pro se, he was doing all this stuff, and then just brutally, brutally murdered. He'll, no one will ever know about his case. I mean, who, who, how? You can say his name if you remember it. A Ty Lopes. We've, we've mentioned a couple of times Jamal Trulove. Should we tell his story? Sure, David. Uh, this is one that <clears throat> really hits home because uh, it, it really typifies the issues that we've been describing. So Jamal Trulove lived in the uh, housing projects called Sunnydale in San Francisco. He was accused of killing a, a young friend of his. And uh, it took a while to bring the case to trial. And his conviction, which resulted in a 50 year to life sentence, uh, was based not on any forensic or physical evidence, but only on the testimony of a single eyewitness who initially told police she wasn't sure who fired the shot that killed this young man. And then some two years later, she decided that she was sure that it was Jamal Trula. And she mentioned that she had seen him. Jamal was a young rapper who appeared on some television shows uh, displaying his talent. And after seeing him on TV, and TV is going to come back here as another part of this witness's uh, testimony. Uh, <clears throat> that she decided that he was the one. So she also told prosecutors that she was reluctant to testify. Now, many people are. They don't want to be a part of the court system, whether it's just inconvenient or because they don't want to be the person who gives testimony that can send somebody to jail. So this eyewitness was, uh, you know, reluctant. And the district attorney put her in the witness protection program. They spent over $60,000 on hotel rooms for her and members of her family. And this becomes pivotal. In the closing arguments of the case, the prosecuting attorney, a woman named Linda Allen, uh, she claimed that the jury has to believe this witness testimony because she has put her life at risk. 
The appeals court was blistering when it took a look at this conviction. And they said that Linda Allen committed, quote unquote, egregious misconduct. That related to the uh, failure to share exculpatory evidence, but also this closing argument, the appeals court three to nothing ruled, was made up out of whole cloth. And in the retrial, where Jamal Trulove was acquitted, the same prosecutor was permitted to try him a second time, but without the claim that the witness feared for her life. The witness took the stand in the second trial and acknowledged under cross-examination that there was no specific threat. It was stuff she had seen in the movies and on TV. Yeah. And this comes back to my comment earlier about how television and Hollywood poison the minds of people in these true crime dramas that are often fictionalized to some extent. They're based on a real story, but they're not the whole real story. All right. So fast forward. Uh, True love is acquitted. He wins a total of $13 million in damages. So that's a a very explicit acknowledgement of his wrongful conviction. But the prosecutor and her boss never apologized or acknowledged even any errors in in the matter. So uh, then Laura Bazelon, who is a distinguished law professor at the University of San Francisco Law School, she filed a complaint with the State Bar Association. And later, she filed a second complaint against this same prosecutor, Linda Allen. And in the True Love case, her claims were dismissed because they weren't brought in a timely manner, a statute of limitations. Well, the dispute was whether the clock started running after the first wrongful conviction or after that conviction was over or essentially overturned in the retrial. And Bazelon and her lawyers made the case when they appealed the inaction by the state bar to the state Supreme Court. And the court ruled five to one not to take the case, even though Bazelon showed very clearly that the the time limit had not been exceeded. Yeah. And so, you know, we have a fairly liberal state Supreme Court. They're not directly elected like in Wisconsin or Texas, where we've seen these incredible campaigns. Uh, But the lawyers protect other lawyers. And the state bar has a lousy record, even outside of prosecutors, in holding bad lawyers accountable. And that's what we're aiming to fix by creating a new commission in California that would be independent, transparent, and have the authority to investigate these matters. And I want to make just one more point, that the claims of misconduct are not merely the arguments of a defense legal team. They are not merely the argument of a newspaper columnist or some third party. These claims of misconduct come from the judges who have overturned the wrongful convictions. Right. So they're not partisans, they're, they're not uh, taking sides uh, or just having too much sympathy for the person who was convicted. And I'll just close by saying that many of the judges who review these cases are former prosecutors themselves who uphold a standard and don't just want to see a conviction for a conviction's sake. We're speaking with Peter B. Collins and with Kat Dean. The report can be found at itcouldhappentoyou.org. The two is a numeral two, itcouldhappentoyou.org. Kat Dean, if we have prosecutors committing felonies uh, and there's no dispute about it, uh, what can we do about it? And, And what would creating a commission do about it? The commission would be able to recommend and the commission itself cannot prosecute 
but it can investigate, put together, I mean, it can subpoena witnesses, it can do a full investigation and submit that to DAs to actually go after prosecutors, fellow prosecutors. Whether or not, you know, they will do that, you know, is hard to say, but certainly the pressure will be on where it does not pre currently exist. And a commission could compel or at least persuade possibly DAs to act in a way that the facts that seem to be publicly available at this moment don't? Well, actually, the facts aren't that publicly known. That's that's part of the problem. Most of the public has no idea this is going on because the state bar does not publish any reports on prosecutorial misconduct or even how many cases are filed with them. So right now, I don't think the public is that aware. That's one of the things the commission can do. The commission will be putting out yearly reports to the legislator, the governor, and the public, not only on what is what they've discovered, but on recommendations. But your report can be sent to district attorneys. Uh, are, are we to assume that they won't act on the basis of facts? They'll need public pressure before they will act? Well, we haven't seen a whole lot of change since the Northern California Innocence Project report, <laughs> which was who di disseminated uh, statewide. I, I I don't know. It's like the fox watching the chicken, you know, the chicken coop. Yeah, and, and <laughs> David, we, but without we... outside discipline, without some kind of accountability it doesn't seem to to shift things very much i'm sorry peter yeah well i was going to say we might make a parallel with the january 6 commission that was a, created by congress uh and it exposed a lot of um the important details of what happened on january 6th but it could not prosecute individuals it made referrals to the Justice Department. And, you know, we try to be realistic here about what is actually achievable in the current climate. The post George Floyd uh, momentum to fix serious defects in the criminal justice problems, uh, justice system, uh, stalled out. It was ridiculed by Donald Trump as woke, and that pejorative continues to this day. Uh, Democrats initially talked about reform, but they steered clear of the term defund, and uh, mostly that has run out of gas. And legally, we're up against the immunity, the nearly absolute immunity that prosecutors enjoy. And people understand the qualified immunity that police officers um, are entitled to, which enables them to operate with impunity. And it's fair to say that most prosecutors consider themselves very safe in pandering to the public to win a conviction, even if it is not based on a solid legal foundation. If New York State has set up a commission to address this problem, and California, with your leadership, is trying to get one. I hate to think what state the other 48 states are in. Well, I'm not an expert on all of the other states. Uh, I just want to confess that I've been focusing on California for the last 30 years. But anecdotally, and what I you know read in the news, um, we don't have much confidence. I mean, right now, the Glossop case in Oklahoma is a real extreme exception. This is a man who is uh, considered to be innocent by the Republican Attorney General of Oklahoma, but he wasn't able to get the system in Oklahoma, the parole board and other entities to agree with him. And remarkably, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, has issued a rare stay of execution in the Glossop case where he was scheduled to be killed on May 18th. And that is the outlier. That's the anomaly. Uh, and in some states where we have, uh, and I'll characterize them as bloodthirsty governors, um, you know, these issues are just waved aside. 
and uh, the, you know, we, we saw the governor of Texas move to commute the sentence uh, or pardon a man uh, hours after he was convicted because Tucker Carlson told him to. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, <laughs> Kat Dean, how can, we have just a, a few minutes left. Can you what can you tell us about this coalition and next steps and what people can do who want to help? Um, the next steps is we're going to be um, launching two interviews that Peter Collins um, conducted with Jamal Trulove and Laura Baslin. That's going to be happening this week. They'll be very interesting. We are also going to be launching the campaign in June where we will be unveiling the bill in full. And we welcome anyone in California who wants to join our steering committee to be a part of it. We, you know, California is a very large state. So we could use volunteers from all over the state. Obviously, if you want to donate, that would be fantastic. And if you want to share any of your own stories with us, that would also be fantastic. And people can do that at itcouldhappentoyou.org? Absolutely. Or they can contact me on any, I, I my information is there as well. <laughs> and, and, and I'm fine this, with emails. <laughs> and, and this again is a bill to create the commission to, yes. to investigate these cases of prosecutorial uh, yes. misconduct. Yeah. Yes. yeah and, and David, I've always, uh, you know, had a very low opinion of lobbyists, but uh, I am now a lobbyist, <laughs> not registered, not paid. <laughs> but I am lobbying legislators and our team will be walking the halls of the Capitol to uh, educate legislators about the problem and our proposed solution. And it's a long process. Uh, you know, you have to pick up the votes one at a time. And one of the misperceptions people have of California is that you just look at the numbers we have Democratic supermajorities that have control of both houses of the legislature. But those majorities are comprised <clears throat> of a lot of moderate Democrats, a lot of pro-police, pro-prosecutor Democrats. And I just want people to be aware that this, is a, it, it, this will be a real struggle to persuade them in an election year next year at a time when the uh, uh, false fears about crime are being stoked. And, and in saying that, I don't dismiss that people have some realistic fears about crime. But time and again, we see that there's more crime on television than there is on the streets. And seconds. it leads people to overreactions and to resist the kind of change that we're proposing. Well, I hope very much that you succeed. I think it's to the benefit of people in the rest of the United States and world that California and New York succeed and it become a model. People can help out at itcouldhappentoyou.org. Peter B. Collins and Kat Dean, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. David, it's a pleasure. And thank you for all the work you, you do on social justice and peace. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.